Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Let's dive into today's conversation regarding life's myriad transitions and how we refine our responses in our relationships, our wellness, our households, our work, and in our practices. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have with me today someone to whom I have looked up for a long time. Paula Arai was raised in Detroit by a Japanese mother. She did Zen training in Japan. She obtained her PhD in Buddhist studies from Harvard University in 1993. She is now a professor at the Institute of Buddhist Studies in Berkeley, California. She is the author of four books that I love. One is called Bringing Zen Home. One is called Women Living Zen. One is called Painting Enlightenment. And the fourth, the book about which we are here today, oh, is such a joy to have on my altar. It's called The Little Book of Zen Healing, with a beautiful watercolor on the cover. The subtitle is Japanese Rituals for Beauty, Harmony, and Love. Welcome to the podcast, Paula. Thank you for having me. Mm. Pico Ayer wrote your foreword, and I thought maybe it might be nice for our listener to hear a part of this. And I'll just read the first two paragraphs. Again, this is Pico Ayer reading his foreword. And his foreword is entitled Medicine for the Mind. When my father-in-law passed away in Kyoto, and then my mother-in-law, then my wife's uncle, I marveled at the clarity of everything that followed. At precisely the moment when most of us are at a loss, grieving, angry, confused, the Japanese have refined a set of rights whereby everyone knows where he or she must go, what they must do, which prayers they must recite. It's not, as Paula Arai reminds us in these pages, a way of taking the heart out of existence. It's rather a way of bringing humanity into the everyday and guiding us through the uncertainty that's part of every life. It's often been noted, he goes on, that the Buddha was, at heart, a doctor of the mind, neither perfect nor immortal, but committed at every moment to trying to heal our unease. Whenever I talk with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, as I've been doing for 48 years now, what strikes me most is his blend of engagement and humility. No physician can save us from death or pain or old age. But any one of us, he stresses, can, if we are so disposed, liberate ourselves from some of the needless suffering that attachment, aversion, and distraction bring. I'm not even going to go on, dear Paula, because what he does basically is set us up for the beautiful heart of yours that comes through in this litany of basically instructions and critical ways of seeing and thinking that bring us home to ourselves again. I'm so grateful for this book. I've dog-eared mm, a good 50%, maybe 45% of the pages. And I just want to really, truly thank you for being here. And may our conversation today be of great service to our listener. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. And the whole book was a prayer to be of some assistance to people. Yeah. Part one is called Offering You a Beautiful Rendering of a Japanese Letter. What can I offer my loved ones, myself, my community, and my environment? Now, if you're listening to this podcast, most likely you are asking this question. And you say in your first line of this chapter, Paula, that the seed for this book was planted on the day your mother died. We're on page one. The seed for this book was planted on the day my mother died, December 18, 1996. Exactly 20 years later and some, my mother died. And a seed was planted that day. It's so interesting for the book that I'm writing now. Mm. 
for Shambhala, weirdly. Mm. I would love to talk to you a little bit and hear you kind of expound upon how and what that seed became. Well, on that day, I had a deep awakening of the power of rituals to help us heal. And it was in the moment that I placed the first stick of incense beside her that you keep relighting incense all night long the first night that I realized at the moment I was feeling the most lonely, the most distraught, um, that as soon as I lit the incense and placed it in the incense burner, I was suddenly connected to all the people who have done it before and all the people who will do this in the inestimable future. And I felt so intimately connected with so many beings that I didn't even know, but I knew we shared this ritual which connected our hearts and our humanity. And I thought, oh my goodness, that such a simple act, lighting incense, could heal was astounding. And so I thought there is more wisdom about healing. And that led me to go back to Japan and learn explicitly about what people do in their daily lives to heal from the various kinds of issues that we all face in one way or another. Hmm. You and she had a very rare opportunity to be together some months before she died when you were studying and researching in Japan, and she came with you. Mm Mm-hmm. And I'm paraphrasing here, but you remark in this first chapter about how your time together allowed her the opportunity to cook for you in her natal land the foods that she used to eat as a child and cook for herself as a young adult, I guess, before she married a European-American and left for America. And you remark on even the quality of like the eggplants and the cucumbers and how they're different in Japan versus how they are in the States. And it seems to me like that time was a very important seminal time, allowing you to create this sort of closure and this connection to ritual rather than the kind of typical confusion that people suffer when their parent dies, which is, oh my God, how am I going to go on? That was marked for me, and I thought it might be interesting to talk a little bit about what you did with your mom during that period of time and how the time was punctuated by these moments where she was able to cook for you and to spend time with you. Yes, to be with her in Japan. We had been for a visit before, back when I was 20, and at this point I'm like 29. So in that interim, I'd learned to speak Japanese much better And before she arrived, I had been living in the nunnery, practicing there. And she had raised us in Detroit with very traditional Japanese values, thinking that would present Japan in a better light to the people in Detroit who had not such positive views of Japanese. Hmm. And here we were now back in Japan together living, and a lot of pain that had been present but not voiced found a way to get expressed when we lived together. So in that way, it was very revealing and healing for both of us that we could be with each other. And because we were only speaking in Japanese, I could be a more filial daughter. English brought out an independence in me that was not as kind. But in Japanese, we connected in ways that were more culturally familiar to my mother and 
surprisingly to myself that felt more like myself too. And it was also my Zen nun teacher, Kito Sensei, who befriended my mom. She's actually about a year younger than my mom is. And so they had lived through similar periods of Japan's history, and she understood my mother in a way that I never could, and affirmed her in a way that nobody in the U.S. did and perhaps could. And so this relationship with the nun is what enabled us to take a very emotionally intense time and turn it into the possibility of transformative healing for both of us. Wow. It's such a gift to have somebody who can give you the perspective on someone so close with some distance that you can trust. Yes. Yes. Section five is about cleaning. And to our listener, each one of these uh, sections is a way to sort of orient yourself. Starts with offering, garden the heart, home is refuge, cook, clean, flow, relate, be, nurse, grow, grieve, beautify, harmonize. These are the chapters. And clean gets me. Because I have a 17-year-old boy who we went to Japan for the first time in April of 2023. And upon returning, he became literally, I'm not exaggerating, a different person Mm. in such a good way. Within a couple of days, I found him with a Q-tip in the corners of his silverware drawer, you know, cleaning the corners of the, wow, got me going right away into my drawers. His whole sensibility has changed. His level of tolerance for his equally aged peers has changed. His tastes have changed. It's unbelievable, actually. But this clean bit, I was also moved by spending a month at the Upaya Zen Center with Roshi Joan this past January, which I'll be doing now a couple of times a year. Just how everything around cleaning is an opportunity to bring my whole self in an intimate way, in a beneficent way, in a giving way, in a generous way, without expecting anything in return, without needing anyone to see what I'm doing. In fact, it's even better if they don't. And it moved me, this chapter. Our listener, we're on page 57. Um, It occurs to me, you wrote about this too, that we are so used to all the mechanized ways of living, you know, even down to the dryer for our clothing. Mm -hmm. And how much time it would take if we didn't have all of these conveniences to actually accomplish the act of cleaning. And in moving through a few weeks of doing this for myself, after I read your book, I started to do things a little bit differently. And I'm now seeing that with this sort of opened perspective, I'm able to connect to my bodhicitta, to my heart of offering, again, without expecting anything in return or anyone to notice, so much more deeply throughout the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Japanese nuns, you say on the bottom of page 58, Japanese Zen nuns spend much of their time outside of sleep and meditation engaged in manual labor. It is a life of cleaning hard floors and soft cushions. I learned many deep lessons from such nuns, for they draw from the fertile wellsprings of healing wisdom in such basic tasks. The period I spent in a Zen monastery learning the rhythms of their ways required vigilant awareness about the movements of my mind and body and how they affected all around me. One particularly instructive task involved the traditional Japanese practice of relying on the power of sunlight to help disinfect soft items, which are regularly placed out in the sun. The instructions on sunning the meditation cushions were easy to remember. Take out all the meditation cushions and place them on the tarp laid out in the front garden. Aiming to be efficient, I stacked five cushions and carried them out of the meditation hall. I slipped into my hall slippers, walked to the front door, slid my feet out of the slippers while stepping down a level into outside sandals, all the while taking care to keep the cushions balanced. 
I made it to the tarp with the cushions, stepped out of the sandals before stepping onto the tarp. When I bent down to begin placing the cushions in a row, however, one rolled off the pile and was about to hit the ground. Instinctively, I used my bare foot to break the fall and push it so it would fall on the tarp instead of the ground. A sharp ouch cut through the sun-drenched air uttered by the nun supervising the sunning of the cushions. I was confused. I thought preventing the cushion from landing in dirt was surely worth a little clean foot save. How could I have done any better? Besides, why was it so important? The expression on my face revealed that I was more perturbed than perplexed. The supervising nun spelled it out for me. Quote, The cushion is a Buddha, so treat it with respect. Unquote. I had to figure out the rest for myself. I realized that I should carry only four cushions at a time because that was the maximum number I could balance while bending down. I learned that the habit of respecting everything as precious requires polishing your heart. The critical concern is to be consciously careful in how you treat others, whether a person, a treasured bowl, or a tattered rag. Oh, I'm so grateful for your writing. You know, I have a question, and I also have the answer for myself, but I would love for you to answer it for our listener. When you're moving around in your house, yeah. I would love to hear how all of this learning has lent itself to the ways in which you move around in your own kitchen, in your own rooms. Well, I'm not as careful as I was when I lived in the nunnery. At first, I tried to be, but that turns out to make it easy for me to be annoying and irritating to the other people sharing the space. So I've relaxed the details, but have tried to maintain the heart. So, you know, I do like living in a very tidy way. Things get put away. Sometimes, you know, I think they're not needed anymore, and I err on the side of putting it away quickly, and then I'll have to pull it out again if it was still needed or someone else still needed it. But, you know, I have in my linen closet rags carefully folded in different piles of where they are to be used. So now everyone in the household knows which rag to use for which type of cleaning, which towel is used for which type of wiping even. So it's particularly the linens that I see that I did not grow up quite with that level of organization or care. And that is what has been the lasting legacy of what the nuns taught me. James is not going to like this, by the way. My man James, my partner of 10 years, is not going to like this. I'm going to get off the phone with you right now and go to the drawer where all the rags are kept and we're going to start to organize that situation. <laughs> Thank you very much <laughs> to the Zen nuns. <laughs> That's really funny. Although I do find that since living at the Zendo, at the Zen Center, I do find myself folding everything differently, even my son's things. Even when there's a seeming rush, I still move slowly and somehow time stops for me. Yeah, yeah. And when I've moved and had to have new linen closets, I will fold them to find out what's the best way to fold this towel to fit in this space when, you know, things are stacked. So for me, I find if I figure out what works efficiently for the space, then everyone is respected, including the rags, and everyone knows where to get what. And it becomes clear and it just feels good to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Yes. I have a great need for order, so I fully understand. If you're listening to us, dear listener, and you don't have a need for order, I would dare you just to try it for a day or two. Really organize just one drawer and see how it feels to open that drawer once it's organized. It's the best. Chapter 8 is B. I like how you ask a question at the beginning of each chapter that inspires me. How can I expand my perspective so I can accept reality as it is and simply be, even in painful circumstances? This is a question on all of our minds, I'm certain. And for our listeners' sake, 
What teaching or practice or observation have you made that has made the biggest difference in this realm of your understanding? One of the things is how hectic I can make daily life feel the awareness that doing such does not really get things done any faster, more efficiently, or reach my larger aims of living, you know, in harmony with peace in my heart and being uh, caring and kind to those around me. And that pausing, even just for an instant, can make such a qualitative difference in the way I move in the moment and becoming aware that that didn't slow me down. It just made everything flow better. I won't say I become more efficient, but it flows, which just makes it's an entirely different quality to getting a big, long to-do list done. Hmm. You talk about the story with your son, how you had to sort of change the, speaking of flow, that you had to change the flow of your days so that you would have more time, so that you weren't constantly apologizing to your kid. We had a similar experience, you and I, in this realm. For many years, I was trying to work on myself and fix the haste, fix the haste, fix the haste. And when I read this, I'd already gotten through it pretty much, but boy, reading this particular page, page 98 into 99, really helped. You say, my daily apologies to Kenji, your son, rang hollow since I did not change my ways. I felt particularly alone when someone tried to show solidarity with me <laughs> by saying they were single parenting this weekend, this week or two weeks since their spouse was away. But solo parenting better described my situation. I only got relief when I paid for it. I was alone with my child's midnight fever spikes, alone with all the many tasks of raising a child and keeping up a household, groceries to buy, floors to vacuum, meals to prepare, gutters to clean, schoolwork to oversee, snow to shovel, lessons to drive to, furnaces to get fixed. It seemed like a never-ending stream of demands and fierce competition with my research, teaching, and writing. I saw myself as a victim of a sexist, racist, institutional culture. I carried a knot of resentment and victimhood, which I wrapped in piercing barbs of self-rebuke for yelling at my son. I felt shackled to my past pain and future fear. Being in the present was an abstract concept. I lost track of what it felt like to just be. For guidance, I turned to my esteemed Zen teacher, Kito Sensei, whom you've mentioned uh, previously, and devout lay elders. The Japanese word, yurusu, am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah. Yurusu recurred in their counsel for the English speaker. It's Y-U-R-U-S-U. Yurusu. It's a verb commonly translated as forgive. They explain that it has the effect of creating more space. <laughs> so cool. This really drove it home for me in the last year. More space in which to move and breathe. When you forgive, or you do possibilities expand, making it easier to see from a wider and deeper perspective. It grows your heart and mind to allow things to be, even things with which you do not agree or do not like. Since negative things and adverse conditions inevitably arise, negativity can build up walls if left raw. It separates that which is interrelated, generating an inherent strain. You know, that strain strikes me as the problem we are all facing right now. Negative things and adverse conditions are inevitably arising. And if we sort of don't address this within ourselves, if we don't forgive ourselves for our humanity, if we don't cease shaming and blaming ourselves, and then cease blaming and shaming others, it generates an inherent strain because we're separating ourselves from what is already inherently interrelated. Yeah. Yeah. How is Kenji now? He's 27. Oh my He's gosh. moved to Chicago and 
I am marveling at our shift in the conversations we do have now are very substantive and they're wonderful. And the types of interactions when we were in closer proximity under the same roof weren't always as edifying. (laughs) Right. Of course. And so to see that you can be even more consciously connecting at a distance than happens, I think, at this age, in this stage of our lives, was a welcome surprise because I feared the distance. And now I see the beauty of the distance. You know, I think it's the distance and your kind of consistency that brings him closer to you. Mm. I surmise that since you were able to address this yelling, as I did, I mean, literally the exact story, it inspires me that maybe I should write about it. But you've been pretty consistent since then. And you've been clear that this was something that you really wanted to address in yourself and you did not want this to come forth anymore. Tanaka-san further explained, you write this on page 99, quote, you need to throw out the past to make room to accept the present. It's about how much you are in touch with the power of boundlessness. If you are sincere, unobstructive, not calculating gain and loss, and let things flow like a stream, then forgiveness and allowing room for things will occur. Water that is hardened will not move. Depending on the matter at hand, you can make room for something by responding with silence. But it is important not to turn anger in on yourself. As you forgive and make room for the present, your heart melts. It's so beautiful. It's exactly what my NBC teacher has taught me about literally and figuratively putting my hand on my heart and just saying how human of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So human of me to feel this way right now. Mm -hmm. It's so nice to see somebody else writing about it in such a candid fashion and sort of owning that part of your formation, you know, and your son's formation as well. Well, you're picking the very passage that I put in the book and left in the book after careful consideration, thinking, oh my God, I am so exposed. I felt so vulnerable, and my editor said, but this is the material that will help people connect to you and to themselves in ways that are vital to healing. So that even as you were reading it, you know, I'm still, tears are still welling up in my eyes because it's a very tender matter, but it is the key to facing it that has, as you see, it is what has enabled my son and I to have a beautiful relationship, you know, now in his, as a, you know, young adult moving on with his life that those seeds planted back then are really beginning to blossom. (sighs) At the end of this chapter, page 109, you write, All healing activities only happen in the present. Accepting this condition is vital because we always have the choice to be focused elsewhere. The more we abide in the present, the more we can engage in activities that heal. And I think this is the key, as I wipe tears away from my own eyes, on my uh, laptop screen behind the recording window, is a picture of my son on a beach in the Caribbean, and he was maybe five, four, five, tiny. And I remember those times of being frustrated, mostly with myself or my conditions or circumstances. What a catastrophe. And then foisting it onto him. And I look at that picture and what that little body must have taken. Mm Mm-hmm. And then I see him now, and he's six two and some, and is so composed and totally watched me do precisely what you've done, 
which is put it in my hand, look at it, all this yelling, all this anger, all this temper, and decide that I'm going to put it down. And um, he trusts me because he watched that happen. And I dare say that's probably what Kenji feels when he reaches out to you to have a substantive conversation with you. So beautiful. So nice to connect in this way. Um, I'm going to page 116. So beautiful. 116 is in chapter 9, and this one is called Nurse. And the question at the start of this chapter is, how do I nurse myself, my loved ones, my enemies, our Mother Earth? Another potent question that's on the minds of all, including our listener today. When we care for others, you say, our senses guide us to what their needs are. Okay, I just want to hold there for a second and say that again. When we care for others, our senses guide us to what their needs are. So if we are not tending to our own inner silence, our senses cannot give us that guidance. And I think that's really important for our listener to hear. If you're here listening to us and you're like, I just really want to learn. Where's the nugget? I want to learn. What's the nugget from today? It's this. (laughs) Take care Guard your own inner silence. Guard your perspective. Guard your ways of seeing. Because if you don't, your senses can't guide you to the needs of others, and you can't be of service, and you will be in pain. The more you serve, the less pain you'll feel. What led you here to this whole section, and particularly the word nurse? So, you know, I had cared for my mom as she was dying and Kenji my son had just been born so nursing him literally and figuratively at the time I am helping my mom through her journey moving closer to death and then jump to the Buddhist teachings in regard to the senses can sometimes be construed to suggest that our senses are the portals through which we are deluded, and that's what causes our suffering. And in the Japanese Buddhist transformation of the teachings or the aesthetics of the teachings as they unfold there, see, you don't suffer say, seeing a flower wilt um, doesn't cause suffering if you are accepting you know, beautiful flower, now wilting flower, things just change, and you can see the beauty in that impermanence. And when you see the beauty of the changes that your senses experience, you don't suffer. And to see the beauty of these changes requires having a very large perspective on what's happening, all the way out to, you know, we have iron in our blood because of star explosions creating iron, which required that heat of the explosion. And so seeing senses as portals to beauty rather than portals to delusion is something I've given a lot of thought to. So our senses can be our friends to help us see suffering and to help us know what will be effective or skillful in helping others. So, you know, some versions of Buddhist teaching suggests that it's our emotions that are clouding us. But when you lean in deeply, you can see more of the context that gives rise to those emotions that then help you get in sync with the reality as it's unfolding. Hmm. I don't know if this is making sense, but that's how my mind was working. No, 100%. And I think that synchrony that you're speaking about is what enables us to be of service. Yes. 
nurse ourselves, others, earth. On page 117, I think this is the bow on the gift that has been this conversation. Fixating on something, a deadline, a prognosis, a dream, prevents you from experiencing the fullness of our interrelatedness. Resisting reality and rigidly grasping onto a point requires tremendous energy. Not only does it sap your ability to concentrate on kind behavior, but it also often inflames fear and anxiety. Loosening your grip and breathing into disruptive emotions expands the space from which you perceive them. And doing so can release energy to envision more creative responses to causes and conditions. Seeing deep connections that undergird any situation can help acceptance percolate and gratitude bloom. Creatively nursing with heart in hand, intently imbuing actions with awareness of the significance and import of each gesture of care, nurtures both the care receiver and giver, intertwining body, heart, minds in a healing dance of compassion. (sighs) You are a phenomenal wordsmith. And our listener, if you want to just go ahead and rewind 30 seconds to a minute and go back to that, I think it might help. (laughs) This whole idea of fixation in our society, the way we fixate on our opinions and our judgments and our fears even we fixate on our victories sometimes. Mm -hmm. This is so important for us. And I thank you for that piece. I I do think that's a wonderful way to close. And I do want to give you a chance to close us out. But before I do, for the few folks who are listening, who are Zen practitioners, particularly even Soto Zen practitioners like Paula and like myself, the other books that she has written, Bringing Zen Home, Women Living Zen, which is part of a big project that she did, research project, and painting enlightenment, unbelievable. If you have a little like list of birthday gifts or somewhere you keep a list of things that you would like, I promise you, you want all of her books. Painting Enlightenment is also Shambhala as this, the little book of Zen healing about which we've talked today. Women Living Zen is Oxford. And I don't know what Bringing Zen Home is who the publisher was there, do you recall? University of Hawaii. Got it, of course. I think we should close, but I do want to offer you a chance to maybe even read some of the examples from the back of the little book of Zen Healing. There's a lot of how-to in this book that we didn't touch on because we just went all the way to the depths really quickly. But if you're listening and you're curious... And maybe you don't even have a practice yet. Don't matter at all. On a pilgrimage, Paula began after her mother's death, as she mentioned. She encountered numerous different Japanese Buddhists who taught her the remarkable power of ritual to heal. um, Practices that you can adapt to your own cultural and personal circumstances. There's a list of what you teach in this book, and I thought it might be nice to just hear you read that short list. Of the 10 healing activities? Yeah. And these came out of working with the Japanese women, and I verified with them if they saw themselves in these. And amazingly, the 12 women who did not know each other working on this with me, all but one, came up with two that I was missing. There were originally eight. They all added, the other 11 added two of the same items, which I took as both affirmation that what I had come up with was resonant with their lives, which is always a good thing when you're doing research. And the two they added helped me see how I had not seen them because of where I was in my life, which underscores the nature of research is requiring self-reflexivity. But the 10 are experience interrelatedness, create beauty, express gratitude, nurture self, 
Accept reality as it is. Embody compassion. Orchestrate rituals. Live body-mind. Expand perspective. Enjoy life. (laughs) And if you want to know, it was enjoy life and accept reality as it is are the two that I couldn't even fathom. The first, enjoying, because I was in that hectic mode (laughs) at that phase of life. And it just didn't seem possible to accept reality as it is. But they showed me that it is certainly an aim to never give up on. Mm. It's not even a possibility. It's like an imperative. Yeah. The more we resist, the worse it becomes. Yes. So beautiful. Thank you for taking the time to find and read those to us. I really appreciate your time today, Paula. I really, truly can't. I know I thanked you at the beginning before we started recording, but like you have been a major beacon for me on the path to Zen. And I really thank you for your presence here in my house and in my heart. Thank you. Well, thank you. I sit so much alone at my desk to interact with people about this is so precious to me. Wow. Well, anytime, just so you know, I'm one email away. Anytime you would like to run ideas, talk about anything, I am right here. I am literally doing my best to walk in lockstep with you, even though I'm think 10 years younger. I'm 53. Yeah, I'm 63. Yeah, and um, it's funny, we both had our boys at age 36. I know. <laughs> and I have a picture on my desk of my son by the ocean when he was at the, it was seven. Oh, but gosh. like, we're like really in lockstep. <laughs> yes. Well, I am here. I am at your service anytime I'm down and ready to talk about anything you're working on because it fascinates me and truly delights me. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. I am mm. brewing a project, and I'll get in touch with email. Yes, email I love it. it. I love it's it. It's called thank Women you. Liberating Buddhism. Yes. Oh, my gosh. At some point, I think probably in the next 10 to 12 years, I am going to be ordained. I have decided. I'm starting with chaplaincy. I've already taken the precepts, sewn my rocks to been to Japan. I'm going again this year to study, and then I'm definitely going to go for ordination if that seems like it's in the cards. So I'm I'm right here. Mm -hmm. Right here. I look forward to staying in touch. Yes, me too. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.